Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't understand uh, how to analyze uh, based on or using the Marx and algorithm. I think uh, there is a question. Therefore, uh, oops. Uh, here is that. How, how can we analyze uh, based on uh, this equation? That means it brings the number or uh, I don't understand. Well, and th the point to make is that we don't actually do these calculations. The algorithm, so these calculations, the algorithm is based on, on um, uh, this equation. So we need to provide the, the pieces that go into the equation, if that makes uh, sense. So Does it bring uh, an output here? I'm sorry? Bring uh, an output or the... Yes. Uh, and I should have had um, like a screenshot of, of the actual software. Maybe that would have been um, more uh, informative than the the nuts and bolts of the uh, algorithm. But um, you have uh, free software that you download, and you input data, and you get uh, the prioritization solution out. You don't do the calculations manually. If that makes, if that helps. Okay. H how can we conclude? Uh, I, for example, that uh, uh, when we analyze based on other uh, softwares, uh, for example, that in the, in the level of significance, for example. Ah, yeah. significance. Okay. Well, in this case, uh, in this case, what you get at the end of the I'm sorry, I'm blocking uh, other students. So what you get at the end of it is the the, the cheap uh, the least cost solution. So you don't get a significance like you know when you run uh, a statistical test, but what you get is the least cost uh, solution. You get a, a you have possi different possibilities, different combinations. Uh, the algorithm uh, indicates which one is the uh, least cost one. So the, yeah, there is no not a statistical. It's an optimization, uh, a ranking, I guess I should say. So at the end of the Ordering. day, if you've given it 10 sites, it might say, come what may, include these first three. Those are crucial. Maybe they are highly complementary. Here's a lowland site, a highland site, and a grassland site, something like that. Okay? But then, after those top three that are crucial, it may find some uncertainty. And that's, that's, what, that's what Mona's talking about. With it. It's a... It's a ranking where it says, well, the fourth site might be this or might be this. The fifth site might be this or this or this. Okay? But it's, it, as Mona said, it's not a significance test. It's a prioritization. So it's like a shopping list. First you do these. And if you can, you do this. If you can, do this. And the last priority is down here at the end, that tenth site. And that tenth site may include maybe not big areas or no species that weren't represented in something higher on the list. Okay? So it's more of a ranking than any sort of definitive solution. And the real question, which is, which is hard to get at depending on the complexity of the situation, is, you know, is the ranking of this place as number six really significantly higher than this place as number seven? And that's where the uncertainty comes in. You don't, you don't know how these different costs and benefits weigh out. And so sometimes the decisions, especially as you go farther down the list, the decisions get harder. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so uh, going back, what I wanted to do, I'm going forward, what I wanted to do is show you a couple of, of examples, uh, published studies that use these uh, uh, algorithms, one of the two, uh, well, um, one each. So one uh, paper that I selected because uh, the study was done, the study is uh, uh, located in Africa. <laughs> Uh, one study is, uh, there are plenty of studies using ResNet, so I, but I picked one that I thought is more, um, I don't know, uh, 
more of, of more interest uh, to you. So what, uh, what this study did was to um, consider uh, as biodiversity surrogates uh, plants, birds and, and monkeys, or pl uh, plant, bird and monkey species uh, for um, Bioko uh, in Equatorial Guinea. And then the, um, uh, this, this particular uh, analysis considered four different solutions based on four different land budgets they have or budgets to acquire uh, land. So uh, maybe best, best case scenario would be a lot of money, a high amount of, uh, of uh, a large amount of money available, and uh, least uh, favorable uh, or solution would be uh, most limited amount of money available, yes. Have, have we explained what biodiversity surrogates means? I mentioned uh, in a slide, but oh, okay. we, can, we can clarify. Is that clear to everybody? Surrogate, yeah, it's not a very surrogates intuitive just, word. Yeah. Surrogates just mean we don't have information for all species, so we're going to assume the information on the species we have it represent everything else. Now that's we'll a bad assumption. And we'll talk about that. <laughs> yes, okay. Tomorrow. Oh, good, good, okay. So it's not a great assumption, but in this study, they're using the term biodiversity surrogate to make it clear that they don't have information about all biodiversity. They just have information about plants, birds, and monkeys, and they're going to hope that that represents everything else, which it pretty much surely does not, but that's life. <laughs> okay, so then this, what this figure has here, um, if you see the dotted line, this represents the uh, extent of uh, sorry, this represents the extent of current uh, protected areas. And then I have to remind myself um, what are the uh, colors. Okay, so the, the colors represent how frequently areas were selected in, um, in uh, over 100 runs of this uh, algorithm. So the areas that were most frequently, um, frequently selected were the ones in red, right? So we have over 90% of those 100 runs, the, those areas came up as, uh, as important for um, considering the, uh, uh, the biodiversity surrogates they had and the four scenarios of funding availability to purchase land. Um, the other uh, point I wanted to make, oh, uh, so the four, the, the A, B, C, D um, um, uh, figures, or maps represent the four different um, scenarios of uh, budgets they had. So if they have 12% um, land budget, they have enough money uh, to acquire 12% of the total area of the island, 25%, 42%, and 50% of the island. So based on how much money they have and based on these um, uh, surrogate species, they uh, came up with four different uh, scenarios of uh, uh, place prioritization. Any questions? Yes, Emily. Ah. No, it's just uh, clarification, but I, really I, can't see, I can't seem to see the colors on the... Oh, where are the blues and the reds? So most of the pixels you see, most of the areas are actually are red, and we have some yellow here, some green here. Here we have blue, blue. So most of the areas have brown been consistent. Brown, brown, uh, brown. We have we have dark green and light green. So it's it's red. Red. It's the red. So and the this is red. I don't. So we have blue with two hues of green and red, and these are represented on the map. So. Uh, the red looks brown on the back. There's a whole class from back in the Uganda course about use of color in <laughs> science. It's really not my publication. No, 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 no. <laughs> but really neat um, commentary by Arturo Arinho, who uh, has put a lot of thought into visualization in science. Now, my eyes don't distinguish between red and green very well. I'm not massively colorblind, but you know, when I first started spending time with my wife, she would say, 
do you like this lipstick or this lipstick? And I'd say, they're the same thing. And she would get very upset at me. And finally I thought, well, wait a minute, you're colorblind. But putting reds and greens next to each other, about 10% of humans will either not see it or not see it very well. So if I were you know, grading this as a, as a figure for science presentation, I'd say putting those next to each other, and especially these two hues of green, is a pretty... And especially since the, the, uh, these uh, pixels or these areas are very small and rare. So there are just a few pixels here and there that are green, the two hues of green. So yeah, it's not easy to see. But in a nutshell, across the four uh, land uh, budget scenarios, uh, most of the, uh, um, most of the uh, solutions, the 100 iterations, agree. So where you see brown or red, depending on <laughs> what you see over there. So the dominant color basically tells us that there is agreement among the 100 iterations uh, provide, uh, run with this, with this software, which, which is, I guess, a good thing because we want, we want the solutions to converge. Yes? So uh, I'm a little confused. To tell us what the dotted line is again. It says it's a plan for a biosphere for reserve, but it seems to be a plan for the entire island. Yeah, yeah. so uh, the dotted line represents uh, existing protected areas. So this is one, uh, and I assume this is the other one. So dotted lines represent what is already protected. What these researchers are proposing is additional areas uh, to complement the current protected area represented uh, by the dotted lines <laughs> that are not very visible. Um, but in addition to what's already protected, what can, we, uh, what can we provide using these, uh, these species surrogates, these biodiversity surrogates, plants, birds, and monkeys? Okay. Is it more or less clear or not quite still? Everybody tired? Ready for coffee? Um, okay, the next, uh, and I think I'm, I'm almost done, um, so we'll, we'll be out, uh, uh, we'll take our break very soon. The next example I, want, I wanted to provide is uh, a slightly more complex one, but just to show that uh, uh, these approaches are quite, uh, quite powerful in terms of um, evaluating different scenarios. So this paper was published in a Journal of Applied Ecology, um, and um, it explored trade-offs among spatial planning scenarios. So multiple scenarios, we saw pre the previous uh, study used, in a way, uh, the previous study also used multiple scenarios for uh, scenarios of funding availability. Uh, this one uh, is a bit more complex because the planning scenarios take into account several uh, several criteria or several conditions um, and um, so some s s the I just said the conditions or the uh, criteria proba uh, prob proba probability of site destruction uh, which sounds very um, I don't know very catastrophic but it, it means uh, degradation of or, or uh, pressure on that particular site because of uh, anthropogenic effects and then cost of the site, um, and the cost was evaluated or estimated based on the popula uh, human population uh, and the stoppable or rever reversible threats. And I'm, I'm glad Bilal is not paying attention because we are using a lot of words that I think make him, uh, make him um, uh, upset or, or slightly irritated. But uh, coastal population encroachment or pressure uh, and ver versus uh, threats that can be stopped at this point or can be reversed uh, if they have already occurred. And then uh, the conservation status of that, uh, of that uh, particular uh, piece of land. Okay, so then um, here are 12 different scenarios um, and these scenarios were compared uh, and uh, the potential trade-offs between these uh, costs 
uh, were, uh, were, also, were also quantified. So we have 12 different scenarios with threat probability either included or excluded cost, uh, different, tapes, uh, sorry, different types of costs with reversible tra uh, threats versus coastal population, and then conservation uh, status. All protected areas are locked in, only the terrestrial ones are locked in, no protected areas are locked in, so on and so forth. So all possible combina all possible 12 uh, combinations, 12 scenarios that take into account combinations of these initial, uh, initial um, criteria. Also, I forgot to mention this since I just uh, I have here, here coastal. This study was done in South Africa, uh, and it has uh, coastal habitat uh, as the main um, focus of this uh, conservation target. I think. I'm getting to the end, so if uh, there are any questions here, we can uh, address them. This sounds a lot more complicated, and this actually gave a p-value <laughs> because it was, uh, uh, it was a hierarchical approach. Uh, each scenario was run in the algorithm, and then um, the outcomes were, were compared. But uh, we, I think we try to cover a lot in, uh, in a little bit of time. And I hope if, um, if you um, watch this presentation again or get the slides, I hope you're going to click on the links that provide additional information how to uh, run uh, ecological niche models to get at those numbers of species. Um, um, town just got up and I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, yes. So we talked about this yes, uh, uh, criteria, how to how to uh, generate these uh, prioritization analysis, and then specifically how to run uh, what kind of algorithms are uh, available uh, to run these uh, these uh, prioritization analysis. And again, uh, check the uh, link that I gave you for uh, zonation and more information on place uh, prioritization. But um, not to forget that. Um, when we do this prioritization, when we actually implement, we go from a publication to an implementation uh, stage, having, having cost of land, users, species specific aspects, uh, having these criteria make the prioritization um, outcome applicable in the real world. If we do not include um, uh, uh, criteria like these or, or information like this, we will have a problem going from the um, uh, academic exercise, running the analysis, to implementing, proposing this, this uh, network of protected areas to uh, government, local government, uh, stakeholders, so on and so forth. So uh, yes, make sure that these are included as much as possible. And yes, remember that we have to take into account that we live in a society and we uh, we need to um, be careful about various social aspects ec and economic aspects and include the stakeholders uh, of those aspects. Yes. Thank you, Mona. <laughs> <laughs> you thank me because I ended with social aspects? Be before we go into questions, yes. I think maybe just a really simple cartoon might help this. Um, let me just put up a matrix, and I think it might help in kind of making these ideas clear. 